And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, and horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterward shall they come out with great substance. Thou shalt go to the, thy fathers in peace, thou shalt be buried in a good old age, but in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Okay, so I, in my notes I noted that uh, this altar that Abraham is going through, and you mentioned the altar, you were yay in about it, so that's this altar that Abraham has set up is, is God's altar, but it is like a shadow thing. It's like a dream, or it's like a vision, or it's like a, um, a, a practice for Abraham offering up his firstborn son. And um, it is prophetic also, we know that, but um, it's, um, well, let's see here. Right at this moment, the things Abram is going through is only practice and a demonstration of what is to come. The real altar will come much later in his life, which you know to be Genesis 22, um, and extend into the future. Meaning what God is releasing to Abraham at this point, because this is sort of a, uh, this is a, a, a further understanding of the altar for Abraham. I mean, he's altered, 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 you know, he's done that. But this one is like he's involved in it. I mean, doesn't it sort of feel to you like he's not just offering something, but he's actually in the big middle of the thing and, you know, and uh, very much involved in it. And, and that's why the Lord is speaking these things to him. So uh, then Abram is told of the process that will take 400 years, okay? It's a process um, that you have to go through for the seed to come forth or the firstborn to come forth. Because remember, this whole Exodus thing is the firstborn coming forth. The whole altar that's going to be real in Abram's life is for the firstborn to actually come forth. Not the birth, but the cross. Yeah, and that's important. It's real important. In fact, it's extremely important because... We just think that Isaac being born is what God wanted and is not. He wants his crucified son. He wants his given son. So, um, uh, his seed will be exiled as strangers, afflicted and ensla enslaved down in Egypt. But afterward, God will execute judgment. Okay? You remember that saying that in there? Afterwards, he shall execute judgment. Amen? Okay, so who's going to be judged? The lamb. He's talking about Exodus. He's talking about Exodus. Remember, this his whole thing is about what's going on or will uh, happen in, in the Exodus. The main one that was judged was the lamb. All fell on him. And so... Um, um, so the judgment shall be upon the lamb firstborn. As a result of that, the father shall bring them out with great substance, both spiritually and tangibly. But will they understand it? And the truth is they won't understand it. And, um, but God will understand it. Uh, you know, yes, he'd like for us to get this. Okay. He would really like for us to really understand this and really flow with it. But the truth is a whole, I mean, just a major portion of this is what's happening between the father and his son. The father and his firstborn son. The father and his given son. And that's where, you know, th this is a thing of, of can I say, two persons that were before the foundation of the world. And it's in their heart and mind and movements, it's the same story over and over. It is. It's the same story over and over until the fulfillment comes, which is the giving of Christ on the cross, his firstborn son, the son whom he loves. 
And um, so um, that judgment, the only one that can truly bear the judgment anyway is the Lamb of God. If we bear it, then we're judge, judge, yeah. <laughs> so, as a result of that, the Father shall bring them out with great substance, okay? Because now it's like the, the, um, the resurrection. Now it's like the lamb is the resurrected one. The firstborn is the resurrected one. All right. So... Um, so I was talking about it, go, it, it it's a pattern and it keeps going and keeps going so I've got a subtitle here called the same experience seen prophetically Okay, so that's what we're talking about with the exodus this experience is the exodus um, it will be the experience of Joseph even earlier it will be the experience of Jacob but not in Egypt but it will be the experience it will be the basic same experience and that that's the thing i mean we have to go all the way back to the prodigal son and we see a certain pattern there and and um you know i mean the way the lord began to show me this was in the prodigal son but there were uh presumptions or or things that i said that weren't written into the story of the prodigal son but i know i heard it from the lord and I know that it was true. And I know that even though there were four or five things that were not written into that story that I was saying this is the deal, then he takes me to Exodus and shows me that two groups came out and one is the firstborn and one is Israel, elder son and prodigal son. <clears throat> and then he takes me to uh, Cain and Abel and shows me that one thinks he's the firstborn like the elder son, but he's not. And when he finds out that God has chosen this one as his beloved son, he kills him. And then we move into Abraham and we start seeing the same thing. We're going to see it in Jacob. We're going to see it in Joseph. And it's basically going to be the same pattern because the father's not little making up little stories along the way. He's presenting one story, the story of his eternal heart. And that's what, he, that's what he wants us to get. Do you, do you see any reason why we should, we should seek to know his heart, to, to truly do that? Not, you know, and we, 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 can't, we can't mistake that for seeking to know deep truths and that's his heart. We have to do it on the basis of what is in you, what was in you from the beginning what, why did you do all of this? And I, I believe that it pertains to your son, but then we seem to be stepping forward that it's your firstborn son, <laughs> and then it seems to be it's the crucified son, and we're, we're gaining ground on it, but we need to know this from your heart. So, um, You see, while waiting on the coming forth of the firstborn seed, Am Abram has also been living what will be their existence after him. He's seeing it in the Exodus. He's seeing they're going through this whole thing. There has to be a death. That he's going to come to that place in Genesis 22. He hasn't come to it yet, but this is the pattern, and he'll be brought into it. And they're going to live it. And Joseph's going to live it. And Jacob's going to live it. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to keep going and keep going. And here's the beautiful thing. If you actually, by the Holy Spirit, see the template, it kind of gets easy. You just kind of flip the Bible open and go, oh, there it is. But if you don't see it, you know, to him that has been given will be given more. Because it just starts rolling. It just starts connecting dots and all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> um, so you see while waiting on the coming forth of the firstborn seed Abraham has also been living what will be their experience after him because it is the pattern of God in bringing forth this seed life which is what what's the pattern what is the the death of the firstborn the death of the firstborn 
To this point in Abram's life, God has been executing judgment on the firstborn of Egypt by killing off. Okay, so here's, we're talking about Abraham and God bringing forth judgment on Egypt. Well, not the Egypt story of Abraham. So let me read this again slowly. Um, to this point in Abraham's life, God has been executing judgment on the firstborn of Egypt by killing off the firstborns of Lot, Eliezer, Ishmael, and will soon be Isaac put to death. That's the firstborn of Egypt. The, these will not be the firstborn. And that's been the whole process going on here. And then I wrote uh, in that same sentence, even while preserving his chosen firstborn seed, Isaac. Okay. So uh, I think right here we'll begin to talk about that. So we need to, we need to think about the, the preserving of Isaac until the preserving of Isaac until, okay, and we've already seen it in the patterns, okay. <clears throat> but the true seed is not Isaac, but Christ, Galatians 3.16. I wonder how well we understand that, that at the cross, God executed judgment on us as firstborn and exalts the only true firstborn. See, he wiped out all firstborns in the sense of when that lamb died, they all died with him. That's the life that they put in him, slaughtered lamb. So they're not a firstborn because they're a firstborn. They're a firstborn because they put him on the inside. But they didn't just like, okay, well, here's a, here's a slaughtered lamb, and I have a cavity that I can shove him in there in my chest cavity. No. It is his life now. And you and I were as the firstborn of Egypt, but preserved by the life of the, the lamb. Preserved for what is the question? Preserved for what? <clears throat> Isaac, as representative of Israel's firstborn, is preserved, or better said, at this point, when all other firstborn candidates are being eliminated, he is redeemed. Because in Egypt, who got redeemed? The firstborn, not Israel. Scriptures are clear. Okay? That is, that is what God did with the firstborn of Egypt. He redeemed them by the death of the Lamb. But he also fed them with slaughtered lamb. Okay? Because his first and foremost goal is not redemption. Okay? It's not redemption. <clears throat> he redeemed them by the death of the lamb, but he also fed them with slaughtered lamb. Why? that they might live by the nature of the firstborn sacrificially. Okay. So he redeemed them that they might willingly be given. He could have just killed them. You know what I mean? He could have just killed them because they weren't right, or he could have just, um, uh, he could have just killed them because they weren't the for firstborn or whatever. I guess my point that I'm trying to get at is that he redeemed them to put a life within them that would be after the father's kind. And that would be his son. That would be his son. He's redeeming us so that we may given, be given by the life of the lamb within us, the slaughtered lamb. Exodus spells that out so perfectly but we're getting that here in Genesis also we're getting you know, we talk about wanting to know the heart of God there she is that's the heart of God 
The heart of God wasn't, um, okay, I made everything perfect and, you know, I, you know, uh, and I wanted Adam and Eve to not sin and just be with me and everything would be hunky-dory, but they sinned, so I'm going to redeem them, and then that's it. Now they won't go to hell. Any questions? You know. But, you know, if, his, if he was so intent on that happening where man wouldn't fall, why do you put a tree in there called knowledge of good and evil and then say don't, don't eat of it? Why do you put a snake in there that's subtle enough to trick you into it? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Why, why do that? Why not just make it all clear and everything and then they just come to him and they don't sin and we all live happily ever after? Because where's Jesus in that? The tree of life that they never ate of. Okay. So, what his plan is then is, yes, to redeem us, um, <clears throat> but we, we still deserve death. So the lamb was killed in place of the firstborn. Right? We still deserve death. Okay. So the lamb was killed in place of it. But then the next step in that is, he said, that lamb that saved you, I want you to put it on the inside of you. Slaughtered lamb, dead lamb, given lamb, put it on the inside of you. Okay? And then he says, that, that process is going to move along, and I'm going to save you from Egypt. Okay, so we go, okay, well, I'm, I'm saved from the death angel, and I'm, 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 you know, saved from my own death that I deserve, and I'm saved from Egypt. And now, you know, all of that was for me. No, he put that slaughtered lamb on the inside of us so that we could come out unto him. Come out unto him. We're not, yes. we're not just jackasses running free in the wilderness because we're saved. Woohoo, you know, and kicking up our heels and yes, this is, this is why I'm all, you know, you have, Lord, you have a full flock of jackasses. Actually, in English, that's not such a bad word, Patty. <laughs> it's worse. <laughs> I saw her cringe when I said that. I went, mm, I'm bitter. I better explain that this is way worse than what you think. <laughs> <clears throat> so, I mean, it's a, it's a powerful thing, isn't it? The order. The clarity in Egypt, in, in Abraham, in all the way through. And every firstborn that's true firstborn ends up dying. Or being, you know, I, one of the things I, I, I have captured recently is this phrase, um, as good as dead. That Abraham and Sarah were as good as dead and God counted that as dead, you know. Yeah, you know. So uh, um, Abel did die, but Isaac was as good as dead. And Abraham was as good as dead. Amen? And Jacob was as good as dead. So if God reckons it on that basis, then we must reckon on God's reckoning. Okay? All right. So... Um, This was the great reality of God in relationship to Israel's firstborn in Egypt before the Exodus. By the slaughtered lamb, they were exempted from death. Amen. The firstborn were exempted from death by the slaughtered lamb. Okay. But only in that situation. And that's what's, what must be understood. If God had have just killed the lamb, which this is... 
basic Christianity 101, at least the way most Christians understand it. If God had have just killed the lamb so that we wouldn't have had to die, then where's his son? And where's the, where's the, the, the understanding beyond that? That's just it. Okay, so I said this was the great reality of God in relationship to Israel's firstborn in Egypt before the, uh, before the exodus. By the slaughtered lamb, they were exempt from death only so they could go to the Father in the wilderness and by the lamb within that was eaten be given in sacrificial death to the Father. Yeah, so what is the Father getting out of it? Oh, he's getting to kill everybody. I mean, that's the way you could look at it. Well, he killed the, he killed the firstborn of Egypt. Um, he killed the firstborn of Israel that didn't put blood on their thing. He, he, uh, um, he ended up bringing them out, the firstborn out in the wilderness and killing them. No, 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 no. We should have died. The firstborn died for us. But not so, I was even talking about this recently, maybe last night, I don't know. That Galatians 2.20, to me, I don't know. I don't know if anybody is, it still explodes in my, you know, when Paul said, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet Christ lives within me, and the life I now live in the flesh, he's saying, I am crucified with Christ, I was and I am with the impact upon me that I ever will be crucified with Christ. Because the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the one who died for me in Egypt so that I could come out and live by this life and give myself. Yes. I mean, that's, yes. that's, that's extremely powerful. To grasp Galatians 2.20 in light of the, the Exodus experience. Actually, it's the Passover experience, but including the Exodus. That we understand that we were not redeemed just so we could be redeemed from, you know, what we deserve. But that we could receive the life who didn't deserve death. who willingly was the lamb who laid down his life and then was placed in us, not as a living being, but as a slaughtered lamb that is the living nature of God. And in so doing, let him do what he did at the cross. Let him live to be given. A child is born, but a son is given. A child of Israel is born, but a son, a firstborn son is given. By the slaughtered lamb they were exempted from death only so they could go to the father in the wilderness and by the lamb within that was eaten be given in sacrificial death to the father. Even before being born, he is redeemed. Israel is redeemed before they're even born. Before they're even born, Israel is redeemed through the death of a ram on Mount Moriah because all Israel was yet in Isaac, right? And if Isaac dies, <laughs> there's not going to be any Jacob or, you know, any of those fellas. Joseph or, you know, Jesus or <laughs> David or, you know, Boaz or not going to be any of them. But by, as it were, Isaac taking that death. See, they were already redeemed. But the redemption is not what it's all about, is it? They had to come. They had to come alive. They had to make choices. They had to choose the slaughtered lamb for themselves to eat, not a dead lamb that happened, you know, 400 years before on Mount Moriah. And in a very real sense, not 
the actual Lamb of God killed on Mount Moriah on Calvary, as it were. But to eat that lamb, we have an altar to eat of which they know nothing of. We do. We do. They don't know anything about it. They just, they just have an altar that saves them from dying in Egypt. So that they can come out and then they think that, the, that all that deliverance leads them to the land of milk and honey. You know, everything's going to be wonderful now. I live in the land of chocolate, milk, and honey. No. No. You don't live at all. You let him live. You let him live. You let him live and give and die and you bear that about. I'm going to bear you. I'm gonna, you talk about bearing the cross, you're bearing the crucified. I mean, the cross in a certain sense, if you just take it literally, is two pieces of wood that's got splinters and all this kind of stuff in it. You, you know, you, he didn't give you one of those. What did he give every one of us? He gave us a slaughtered lamb to eat. Amen. It's called Lord's Supper. Hallelujah. Lord's Supper. But not the symbolism. Right. See, that's to commemorate the actual reality that we're living day by day as, as the firstborn. It's him, but as the firstborn. And we do that to show forth his death to everyone that this is what we're about. But we, we don't live it, and then we celebrate communion and feel good enough to go eat it. God help us. <laughs> because we can get away with it. Except for the Lord says, well, then I'll bring judgment or whatever down on. But the judgment ultimately is still the lamb. The judgment, we don't have to bear any judgment. But we do need to eat the lamb, okay? I'll read this again. Even before being born, he is redeemed, talking about Israel, way back 400 years. Remember, you, this is all about the dream or the whatever experience in the dark, darkness and the horror of darkness and everything. God is showing in sort of a spiritual form, Abraham, this is the future. This is what's going on. You'll have to go to an altar with your son. But the, your seed all the way down is meant for this kind of death, this kind of life. That's what he's saying. He's showing him. You're the father of this. You're the father of this. So you get it right, buddy. Yes. You get it right. Well, good thing we've got chapter 16 where everything works out gloriously. Or does it? See, he still needs to learn. But we know eventually he goes to that altar. He does. And what does he offer? His firstborn son, his son whom he loved. Take now thy son, thine only son. You don't see him kicking or screaming or... You see him with the Lord. Hebrews basically says that. He was with the Lord. Redeemed from what? He's redeemed from giving a firstborn death to him until later. Well, let me read that before that again. Even before being born, he has redeemed Israel through the death of a, man, a ram on Mount Moriah. Redeemed from what? He is redeemed from giving a firstborn death to him until later. Okay. God redeems us, God redeems us so that we may live to give him a firstborn de death later by Christ in us. You all still sad that we're in chapter 15? <laughs> it's, just, it's just life. It's just reality. It's his heart reality. Let's seek his heart. Let's, let's find it so real that it just overwhelms us. And we, and we say, 
Behold, in the volume of the book, it is written of you, firstborn, giving yourself. Redeemed from what? He's redeemed from giving a firstborn death to him until later. God passed over Isaac. And he passed over Israel in the person of Isaac and did not strike him dead. But there has to be, let me tell you, if he redeemed you, <laughs> then the only Christian life is the nature of the lamb within us to be given to the Father. That's, that's it, you know. Um, someone can say, you know, well, you know, a church group can say, well, we heard that. And what are you saying about us? I'm not saying anything about you. I'm talking about Jesus. I'm not. I, the only time that comes to my mind is when I think, well, somebody could take that wrong. But I don't think the Father's taking that wrong. I don't. And I don't think I am either. I don't think I'm, you know, looking and accusing or saying we're better or any of that stuff. That's not in my mind. I'm saying this is the will of God, uh, the, the plan of God, the, the heart of God, and this is the way he wants it. And whosoever will, it just so happens we gathered some here that wants it like this. You know, that's willing. That's willing not just to be delivered from bondage like Israel was, but to be redeemed so that we might be given. I love this when I get to my notes. Um, I have this little section here. It's got red on it and a bullet points underneath. And, it, and I wrote, I don't fully understand this chart and why I put it here. <laughs> 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 I still don't. It looks good, but it doesn't make sense to me right now. Okay. So, um, verse 13 and 14 of Genesis 15. <laughs> and he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in the land that is not theirs. Uh, that's the prodigal son. He was a stranger in the land that wasn't his, right? Abraham? Right? Jacob? Right? Joseph? Oh my God, who's he talking about here? Just his seed. Abraham, your seed. This glorious seed that will, will, will bow to the Father's desire. This glorious seed, which is Christ in us, but it is the Lamb in us, but it is, it is not us, but it is us because we've come into oneness with him, not just agreement. Yes. We've come into oneness, and oneness demands it, but there's no demand. There's, there's no pressure. There's only the flow of life, the flow of lamb life, the flow of endless giving. Endless giving. It's him. And shall serve them, shall serve them in this foreign land. Abraham never possessed the land, but served the Amorites, Israel, and the Egyptians. And they shall afflict them 400 years. That means Abraham from Abraham to the Exodus. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge. So I saw two judgments here, the one that I mentioned before, the lamb was judged. The lamb was the first one judged. Okay? We go, well, I don't want to be judged. You know? Because we're so self-focused. We see judgment and we go, well, I want to be in another category. You know, put me in another category. Uh, he's not talking about you. He's talking about the lamb. The lamb always steps up and says, I will be judged. I'll do it. Okay? Um, but there's also another angle of that. What is that judged in, in Exodus? What is it? 
It's the pretender firstborn. The pretender firstborn. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and I wrote in parentheses, judgment of the pretender firstborn. Lot through Ishmael and Egypt's firstborn, all of it, all of it. If it's not him, it's a pretender firstborn. And let me just add this. This is why it's really dumb to try to be lamb-like. I mean, I'm serious. It's dumb to try to be lamb-like. Don't try to be lamb-like. Either it's the lamb or it's not. And if it's not, then pray for the, the revelation of the lamb. But, but being lamb-like is a pretender firstborn. And if you start drinking the Kool-Aid, you know what I mean? You know, then you're going to go along with something that's not going to lead to where the Lord wants it to lead. You say, well, then should I just act like what I really am? <laughs> no. I mean, God won't kill you, but I will. <laughs> Keep laughing. I need to drink it. And afterwards they shall come out, come out means the birth of the firstborn, with great substance. Afterwards they shall come out. The firstborn is coming out like a birth with great substance. What is the substance? The fullness of Christ. All of the the nature, the ways, the way of seeing, the, the way of proceeding the simplicity of the way of touching that feels different than human hands that try to be gentle. You know, oh, you're a, bless you, you're going, you're going to poke my eye out, dude. <clears throat> All right, verses 15 and 16. And thou shalt Go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age, but in the fourth generation they shall come out, come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. So I wrote, what is, that, what is it that constitutes Abram going in peace and being buried in a good old age? He will have finished his course and can rest when he has finally brought forth the firstborn son through a death of his own beloved that also set the stage for the seed to continue in other born again or firstborn sons. It just sets the stage for it. I mean, that's a good old age. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a really good thing. I mean, when you can rest in that and you know you've, you've released your firstborn, and then the seed's going to go on and it's going to continue because it's the same seed, amen? amen? Then you have that assurance, man, you can rest in peace. Praise, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Still sad we're in chapter 15. We're doing good here. I may finish tonight. Verse 17 and 18. And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. And the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. The preparations begin when the sun goes down. And darkness is upon the land. Remember when Jesus on the cross and the sun went down, <laughs> darkness was upon. When the sun's going down in death. <clears throat> in Abram's case, the sacrifice was then offered. It was then offered in the darkness, in the, I guess you could say, in the brightness of the sun here, reduced down a crucified lamb on Golgotha's hill. The sun has gone down and now it just looks like darkness. But it's the, the, the deepest light. It's the more brilliant light. It's the light of life. <clears throat> The 
The fire fell upon it to consume the inward parts and all the pieces that had been laid out publicly and exposed to the fowls of the air. Speaking of Jesus and all these fowls, well, if you're the son of God, come down and you saved others, you can't save yourself. And all of this tearing like a, like a fowl, like a predator bird, ripping at something that can't fight back. <clears throat> Notice the method of escape is fire falling, the offering rising as smoke, sweet savor, and being caught up to God. That's the, the way of escape is through this death, this glorious death, this blessed death. Praise God. Notice the method of escape is fire falling. Fire falling on the sacrifice, God's acceptance. Not God's deliverance, God's acceptance of the firstborn. You are truly the firstborn of many that will carry this seed, this life, this nature. Notice the method of escape is fire falling, the offering rising now as smoke rising as a sweet savor, rising and being caught up to God, going straight to God, God, God taking it in God. It's, it's the pleasure of the Lord it talks about in Ephesians, the pleasure of the Lord. <clears throat> so, so does the man child of revelation being caught up represented being a sacrifice. Y'all remember that? All right, verse 18. <clears throat> In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram. So everything is founded on death. The sacrificial animals did not deserve such a death and exposure. They were innocent. But these sacrifices have no place to be looked upon as robbed, murdered, or unfairly treated. You only see that as robbed, uh, unfairly treated if you're not a sacrifice of, by, by that lamb, by that slaughtered lamb that you ate. You never digested it. You ate it, but you never digested it. It didn't become you. You, you just chewed on it and said, hmm, this tastes real savory, you know, or whatever, and then continued to be a, a goat. <clears throat> but these sacrifices have no place to be looked upon as robbed, murdered, or unfairly treated. This was not punishment or even meant to be seen as something negative. Instead, it is the height of God's heart, mind, and way concerning his nature. <clears throat> the scripture says he wants mercy instead of sacrifice. In one of those places, he said uh, something like, don't you understand this, or that I want mercy and not sacrifice. Okay, so how do we read that? As carnal, carnal, carnal Christians as we can. Well, God wants you to treat me nice. Yeah. Um, no, mercy, compare, let's compare mercy with sacrifice. Mercy is a thing of nature. Sacrifice is something you do. Amen? He wants it to come out of nature, not just going and doing sacrificial things. He wants his son. He wants the firstborn. He doesn't want your sacrifices without the firstborn who mercy, mercy is... <clears throat> that you deserve death and then he just died for you. Mercy is that instead of saying you need to be, you need to die, he says I'll die. But that's a nature. We see it, we say he's so merciful. Well, he's so him. I mean, he's so him. He's just such that way. You are who you are. I am that I am. I know you are. I agree. <clears throat> you, you in me is 
what I want. I don't want to read things about what people did and then try to duplicate it. I want you to get that firstborn and that savor that comes with it instead of the stench of, don't you remember God said, I hate the stench of your sacrifices. I'm like, you're the one who asked for it. And that's what I said when we were in Bible school in our first row. Wait a minute, you're the one who told us to do this. Except I wasn't doing it, but I'm looking at if I was those people, you know. You're the one who said do this. Why, is, why are you getting upset with us doing it? He goes, can I talk with you? <laughs> come here. Come to my office. It's, this is no office. This is, there's a cross. <laughs> he wants mercy. He wants nature, not deeds that are sacrificial. <clears throat> Then God declares the covenant that has now come about by, by and made upon the earth. Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of, of Egypt unto the great river of the Euphrates. Well, I mean, that's... My God. My God. What are you saying? What are you saying? What are you saying in these words? Are you saying that you're giving this land to your seed that's this great river that flows in Egypt by the Nile to the Euphrates? You're giving this seed in Egyptian bondage. You're giving us that seed there, and you're giving us that seed you, by the Euphrates, Babylonian captivity. You're, give, you're saying that your seed will, will, will proliferate. You're saying that those things are not, the, not bad, but they're a place for the seed to show himself. You're saying that this is the land you'll give us. The one that everyone hates. The everyone that everyone wants to avoid. The one that they pray away. You're saying the two worst places. It's your seed. It's a gift to your seed. That he can live this way. That he can lay down his life. That he can, oh my God, oh my God. And then you see it, you see it. You, you see it in Daniel, you know, you see it in all those guys, and you go, it's there, it's there, it's there. Oh, my Lord. I mean, what kind of God is this that we have? What kind? I mean, it's amazing. You know, none of that promise is based upon Abraham as a man, but upon the seed that is within him that he's releasing, that he will release and it will be in others. And it will be down in Egypt. And it will be in Babylon. None of that promise is based upon Abram as a man, but upon the seed that is within him. The seed will do the dying, and the seed in its death will be the object of God's faithfulness to possess the land. He will possess the land by laying down his life. Now, we've dealt with that before. I don't know if any of you remember that. But in this whole thing of the firstborn, we've dealt with the, the method of possession that comes about through death and in other teachings that I've done. The seed will do the dying, and the seed in its death will be the object of God's faithfulness to possess the land. Verse 6, he believed God. He believed God. Abraham had in himself no ability to reproduce. Remember? What? Where's your seed? I don't have your seed. But I don't have any ability to bring it forth to reproduce the seed. 
in the belief that there's no ability to bring forth Christ. He cannot just say, I'm going to be Christ-like. He may produce something that looks like it, but that which is flesh is flesh, which we know to be the coming chapter here. And then finally, verse 7 and 9. Let me just read my notes here, and that'll be it. Though God had brought Abram out of Ur, which was Babylon, but he was, he was there with a family that worshipped idols. Do you understand that? He was an idol worshiper. The scriptures tell us that. They were idol worshipers. But now Abram is going to release a seed that will be able to go back to his home area. And glorify God by the firstborn. Though God had promised Abram out of Ur, and though he had promised uh, in chapter 12, 1 through 3, a land and a seed, and even though Abram had, had believed God, yet he did not know how this would take place. The whereby of knowledge is the cross. It's the reality, not the knowledge of it. It's the reality of that. That is the assurance and knowledge of the inheritance. That is the, the inheritance is the seed. But wait a minute. The inheritance is the innate ability, ability to, to not put yourself first, to, to lay down your life, to get low, but it's not innate in us. It's innate in the seed. In God's view, a person does not gain the inheritance from someone else who died. And this is an important thing. I think I've mentioned this before, but it gets more important as we go. In God's view, a person does not gain the inheritance from someone else who died. Okay, okay so do we understand that, like, if I die, my children get my great wealth, right? Oh, God, poor kids. But that's the way that we think of it. That's not the way it is, and it's not the way it is. It's not the way it is in God. That, uh, in God's view, a person does not gain the inheritance from someone else who died, but is given to the son who dies. That's a fact. That's a fact. And I can, I can and will prove this fact over and over, uh, in, all the way through Genesis. All the way through Genesis. The reason why we keep getting tripped up is that we keep, you know, <clears throat> I don't want to say it now. <laughs> Let's pray. <clears throat> beloved father, beloved progenitor of, of this seed, your son, Something came out of you, as it were, a son that bears your image and your likeness, that has become beloved son to you, has, has manifested, has shown forth, has become the express image of your person. Mm, whatever we see of Christ crucified or the firstborn, you are the, you are the home base. You are, you are the first tree. Thank you for this story about Abraham. Thank you for filling Genesis with the beginnings. Genesis meaning the beginnings. Thank you that the beginnings are all the same story over and over and over. It is this seed, this way of the seed, the way of the Father. Father, your way found in him. Father, your way found in us because of him. Making us appear as firstborns when it's him, the firstborn, and yet there is the manifestation ever clinging 
as it were, to that old rugged cross, clinging to that lamb nature. Father, we are not even worthy to see such things, to touch such intimate, delicate things of your heart, things that have been hidden from generations. is now made manifest Christ the firstborn in us the hope the hope he's the hope of this so we love you and we seek you and we our hearts tremble at times when we get close to you because we don't know how to handle we don't know how to handle something so beautiful. We have to look away from us and just melt into your eyes and your heart. So Holy Spirit, thank you for breathing eternity into this room, into our hearts. Thank you. Thank you that you're not just teaching, you're not just imparting truths but you are setting the stage for us to be swallowed up of the truth not getting it but swallowed up of the truth as it is in Jesus not as it is outside of him so we long for you we have moments that we just cry out we can't live without you we even when we don't see our problems, we can't live without you. We don't want to live without you. We, we love you. We love you. And we, our hearts will not turn from you. Spirit of God, make it so. Make it so. Make it so. In Jesus' name.